mm-hmm. with NR um, because NMN is so expensive? Yeah, well, historically, some companies started making NR um, early on and made it widely available and cheap to researchers. In fact, so cheap they were giving it away to researchers. So it became used uh, much more often than NMN. Um, but increasingly, and if, if any scientist uh, lab wants some NMN, let me know. I'm happy to subsidize it if they'd like. Uh, but yeah, and NMN was late on the scene because it was harder to synthesize because it's a bigger molecule, needs that phosphate, and phosphate chemistry is quite difficult. So with the with the clinical studies, you know, there's I've seen a couple with nicotinamide riboside, but I guess the you know the the question is with the nicotinamide riboside, there's been a little um, confusion about like you know whether or not nicotinamide riboside is even really getting converted to NAD inside cells and in different organs other than the liver. Um, this was this was this NAD flux paper yeah. um, that that was done by. Uh, Rabowinitz? Rabinowitz? Rabinowitz, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah. Yes, that, that study um, he recently published just a few months ago, yeah. um, looking at nicotinamide riboside and how orally, um, at a dose half of what typically is used in all the other nicotinamide riboside animal studies. So typically they do 400 milligrams per kilogram body weight per day. Yeah. I don't remember how long the duration they were doing it, but. Um, in the NAD flux study, he did 200 milligrams per kilogram body weight, mm-hmm. which is significantly less than what um, all these other studies, like the one you mentioned with Alzheimer's disease uh, and other studies that have shown improvements in mitochondrial function um, in mitochondrial mutator mice and also muscular dystrophy and all that. So yeah, we, we use double the, that dose yeah, as well. Yeah, so maybe, you know, the, the, this uh, NAD flux study that showed um, nicotinamide riboside given orally didn't form NAD in the muscle, but it did in the liver, could have been a dose-dependent thing? It would make sense because we, we, we've done a lot of this in mice and now in humans, and that there's a threshold that you need to cross. You need to take a certain amount to, to get over probably the body's clearance mechanisms, uh, and then you get up to a level that plateaus after about nine days. And they may have just been under that threshold, so the body was just clearing it out. Uh, but you have to seemingly overwhelm that clear-out system. So that's why we do at least 400 uh, mix per kg. And that's with nicotinamide riboside. The question yeah. is, I mean, that's like if you talk about a human equivalent dose for like a 180-pound man, that's like over two grams a day. And it kind of leads me to that ne- my next question, which was um, the most recent clinical study with nicotinamide riboside, where they actually used a much higher dose than the original study that was done with um, basis, the Elysium that had pterostilbin in it. This dose was like 1,000 milligrams a day, and they looked at a variety of endpoints in addition to, I mean, they looked at endurance, um, looked at... It was a Doug Seal study. I yes, think. and and there was no statistical significance in anything. It raised NAD levels, but there was no statistical significance. There was trending improvement in yeah. the vascular system, and um, there was, but there was no effect on endurance, and I'm wondering again, yeah. well, if we, if we go back to the human equivalent dose, what was given to the animals, that was still less than half, I mean, so the question becomes, is it not even making NAD in the muscle tissue at that dose or, you know, so, mm-hmm. um, which brings me to the nicotinamide mononucleotide, yeah. you know, like, now that, those studies have been done in animals at a much lower dose than 400 milligrams. They have, like, uh, yeah. So we, we, in my lab and, and at the company Metro Biotech, we've been using um, a whole variety of different molecules and different, um, we're doing what's called pharmacokinetics. Uh, so there's a lot of literature that I could, I could talk for another hour on. One of the big questions people ask me is, have you ever put NR and NMN head-to-head in a study? And we need to do a lot more of those. Um, typically, they're not done. And I'm unaware of it being done in humans at this point. But in mice, what we see, and for all the NR folks out there, please don't be angry. This is, this is just data. I don't run the experiments. I just deliver the message that at the same dose, uh, NMN will increase endurance and I forget what that dose was. It might have been 200 or 250. Yeah, 200. Uh, NMN didn't increase endurance. Oh, sorry, NR did not increase endurance, but NMN did. Um, we do find that for some parameters, and Matt Cableine, who I mentioned earlier, who he works on dog aging now after doing his SIR2 <laughs> extension lifespan. So Matt also has published that uh, comparing NR and NMN, only NMN worked in his, his disease model, which was a mitochondrial disease where those animals really need a boost of NAD. Um, so one of the issues could be that uh, NMN is, is a better molecule in that regard. Um, it could be that 
maybe the mice just work better than humans and we need a bigger dose. Uh, 